It is a great joy to open the Word of God and read it as we prepare for our study this uh, morning on the Lord's Day. I'd ask you to turn with me to Psalm 33, uh, a marvelous psalm that describes the nature of our God, who is the ruler of the nations, who we are called to worship this day. Please hear the reading of God's holy and infallible word, beginning at verse 1, and we'll read the entire psalm, Psalm 33. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. May God bless the reading of his word. Would you please join me as we pray together? O oh, our Father, we come to you this day because of the throne of grace of the only mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we approach you as our risen Lord and Savior, the Lord of the nations. But indeed, you are our older brother, and we are united to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. O Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence among us, for you are the one that inspired the Word, who quickens hearts to life from death, who sanctifies and convicts and encourages so that we cry out, Abba, Father. O triune God, we pray that your ministry might be rich, that it might be you who teach us today, because your word is sharp and powerful. It's able to penetrate into the depths of our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would hear the cry of your people, some who've come today despondent and overwhelmed, some who are struggling with disease and illness, some who are laboring long and hard through difficult burdens and trying relationships, some who have experienced injustices that are full of pain and disappointment. Oh Lord, we would ask that you might restore unto us the joy of your salvation, that the joy of the Lord would be our strength, and that we might again remember that you are the I am that I am, the one who does not change, the one who exists from himself from all eternity, who declares and things come to be, who has promised that you will wipe every tear from our eyes, that you will make all things new, and that nothing can separate us from your love. Lord, we come to you this day and we pray that as your sheep, helpless, lost, that you lead us beside the still waters and make us to lay down in green pastures, and Lord, if we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, help us to fear no evil. 
for you are with us. And we know that goodness and your steadfast love will pursue us until we dwell with you forever in your house. Lord, nurture your people with your grace. We welcome you today. We are unworthy. Would you cleanse us of our sin? Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, fill us with yourself. May we know that we've met with you, our God. We thank you for all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we turn our attention again to Psalm 33, we begin by remembering that the Psalter is a marvelous gift from God for the worship of his people. It is uh, the collection of the songs for worship, especially penned by David, but there are many other composers of the Psalms. And we should remember not only was it the songbook of Israel, but it was the songbook of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus sang every one of these psalms. Wouldn't you like to know what was going through his mind as he sang these psalms? Realizing little by little, more and more, that they were about him. He is the great singer of the psalms, and he is the focus of them. And of course, there are the songs of the church. We enjoy singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And we give the psalms not only a special place when we sing them from time to time, but especially when we preach them, for they are the Word of God. As we look at the uh, psalm before us today, we are reminded it calls us to worship. In fact, our title is, today is Worship and the One Who Watches the World. Worship. Worship is something that believers do. It's something that atheists and materialists can't do. They cannot ascribe any glory to that which is above them. They look at the world and they see it as a a meaningless cacophony of accidents and chance and random processes. Maybe they worship the fruits of their own mind and their work, but when all is said and done, they realize that life really is without any meaning. Now, most of us really love uh, that uh, great writer called Mark Twain. That was his pseudonym. You know him as, I think it was Samuel Clemens, wasn't it? The Mark Twain's book of Huckleberry Finn and all the other things that were part of it. In the book by Fred Kaplan, entitled The Singular Mark Twain, toward the end there's a chapter called Disappointment to the End. And this is what Mark Twain had to say about life. And as I begin reading with Kaplan's comments, still Twain admitted he was not going to make a public issue about his views on nature and God. He writes, this is Mark Twain, there's nothing kindly, nothing beneficent, Nothing friendly in nature toward any creature, except by capricious fits and starts. Nature's attitude toward all life is profoundly vicious, treacherous, and malignant. Kaplan says, but most human beings were too irrational in uh, Mark Twain's mind and blinded by fear to see the truth, evidence of which was an ever-present part of their own physical lives. Mark Twain goes on to write in his journal, it is the strangest thing that the world is not full of books that scoff at the pitiful world and the useless universe and the vile and contemptible human race, books that laugh at the whole paltry scheme and deride it. Curious, for millions of men die every year with these feelings in their hearts. Why don't I write such a book? Because I have a family. There's no other reason. Now that sounds pretty hopeless, doesn't it? for one of the greatest humorists of American history. He didn't have anything to worship. You have a lot to worship today. You have a God who is created, who's at work, and who's redeemed. As we look at this psalm, we're going to see that it breaks into the following parts. First of all, there's a call to worship in verses 1 to 3. Secondly, we're going to hear why we ought to worship the I Am, Yahweh, or as the old King James puts it, Jehovah. Why should we worship the I Am? Verses 4 through 7. And then we'll hear a second call to worship in verse 8. This time, not for the people of the worshiping community of Israel, but the whole world is called to the worship service. It's a universal call to worship. And then we find in verses 9 to 19, why should we and the whole world worship Yahweh? Why should we lift Him up? And then it concludes with the fifth part, 
which is in verses 20 to 22. We wait on the I am as we worship him. So it's about worshiping. It's about the reasons why we worship him. And then learning to wait on the one that we worship, who's the one that watches us all. As we begin with that first part then in chapter uh, 33, the 33rd Psalm, verses 1 to 3, let me read them again. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous, praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre, make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Now, I know there's a lot of disagreement on modes of worship, but we ought to hear at least what the psalm says and decide how much should be part of Believer's Chapel or not. Okay, I'll ask the pastor to think that one through, right? It's a lot of worship wars. But let's look at the worship words and then say, what, what are part of our worship? Well, did you know it's a command to shout for joy in the Bible? Now, maybe you should only do it in your shower in the morning. <laughs> Maybe you should only do it when you're out all alone walking in the woods. But shouting for joy is a command of God. When do you shout for joy? He asked me to marry him, Mary! Or, I got accepted at the school. I can't believe it, the deal has been signed, it's inked. I saw a beautiful one at the airport. I was flying back from Atlanta early in the morning. And the word came out, the mask mandate has ended. I saw a guy tear his mask off. Hallelujah! <laughs> I mean, he was excited. Worship, praise God. Is it all right? I just said hallelujah. That was our shout for today. You're okay now. I'm not going to make you shout. Okay. I, I, I did it in a sermon illustration, so we didn't change any of the proper decorum at Believer's Chapel. But notice... It says, oh, you righteous. When you're right with God, there are times you ought to stop and say, God, you're great, and worship him. It's biblical. Notice further, it says praise befits the upright. Those that are standing squarely with God's gospel and his word are able to praise. It's a, it's, it becomes them. It's just natural. In fact, the giving of thanks is part of that praise, and it is to be done with music. Now notice, if you go through here, it says, Make melody him with the harp of ten strings. So that, that will cover a six-string guitar and ten strings of a twelve-string guitar. So it's sort of biblical. You can squeeze that in there. You know, the piano has a lot more strings than that, by the way, and you use that, so that's okay. It even says to sing a new song. So in other words, we ought to sing the Psalms, but the Psalms tell us there's new songs to be written and to be sung. <clears throat> and our hymn books that celebrate hymns from the 1700s and 1800s and 1900s is wonderful. I love the classic hymns, but if there's really godly hymns, we can sing those too, if they're biblical. And the music is appropriate for the great theology we're singing. There's no, uh, what's the right word? Uh, you look at uh, a date of expiration on shelf life of foods. Well, songs have sort of a shelf life, but if the truth is in them is true, the melody might change, but the words are still God's words, and they can be sung. It says, sing to him. And notice it even says at the end to reiterate, sing to him a new song, play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. It said shout, now it's in the plural, and it says it ought to be loud. So to, tomorrow morning when you're in the shower, I want to hear at least one loud hallelujah from you, okay? The Lord will know you heard the sermon if you do that. Okay, so call to worship. Notice secondly then, there's not only the call to worship of the I am. Remember when you see the words Lord all in capital letters, it's reminding us that in the Hebrew text, this is the personal name of God. The I am that I am, the self-existent one. The one who has no beginning or end, who lives forever in pure present being. Time is under him. He's not in time. He enters into time by being the Lord of all things. And then it gives us then in verses 4 through 7 some of the reasons why we as the covenant people of God should worship the I Am. Let me read those, verses 4 through 7. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all His work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made. 
and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. So that will call on that second worship. But before we look at that next call to worship, let's see why we should worship the Lord as a covenant people. First of all, it's because we have his word. Biblically speaking, the word is the inspired and scripturated text that we have in front of us that's been translated into our language. But we know that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And there's nothing that came to be except through the word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only one begotten of the Father. The written word and the living word. We begin to see Christ emerging in these very texts. He is the very revelation of God. He is the only perfectly upright one. Jesus is without sin. The word of God is without sin. The word of God in flesh is true. The written word of God is true. This is God's perfect revelation for us in Christ and his word. It goes on not only because we worship God because he's given us his word, which the rest of the world doesn't know, which lets us think God's thoughts after him, that lets us think the great truths of salvation and the history of the world. But it also tells us that we have his work that is done in faithfulness. We need to stop here and say, what is it, God's work? Well, if you were here in the earlier service, it's really his providence. It is the sustaining of all things. It is his government of all things. It is his concurrence in all things, fulfilling the purpose from the smallest detail, the falling of a sparrow, the number of hairs on her head to the big things, the boundaries of nations and the seasons and times of history and the coming of the Messiah at the precise time. God's works are all done in faithfulness. That means that they're absolutely reliable. In fact, we are given the sense that God's word is not only upright and true, therefore dependable, but what he does, we can be sure, is as sure as a faithful husband to a faithful wife. The word that's used here is the one found of the Lord's describing his covenant with Israel in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 2. I betrothed you to me in faithfulness. He says, I'm not going to let you go. I'm faithful to you. You are mine. And so we are told that God's works are absolutely reliable. We can depend upon his providence, whatever those providences may be today. You may have come today and say, I know I'm commanded to shout for joy in the Lord, but I'm going through such hard times. I can't rejoice. I'm overwhelmed. It's too hard. This text says rejoice because God's providence, as hard as it may be right now, it's absolutely faithful. God is not making any accidents. As the great Heidelberg Catechism says, not a hair can fall from my head apart from it leading to my salvation. God is at work. That should give you the hope to say, I can rejoice that God knows what he's doing even if I don't understand. Do you remember how Job put it? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. God is good. His works are faithful. And that's why you can rejoice in him today if you know him, regardless of the circumstances that you face. So his word, his works, and notice it's his nature in verse 5. He loves righteousness and justice. His very nature is to see that perfect righteousness and justice are done. When you put those words together in light of the cross, the perfect righteousness we need before God is imputed to us from Christ. The justice that should fall upon sin and will fall upon sin because of God's judgment has fallen upon Christ. And those that are without Christ will face true justice. And that's why we preach the gospel. Flee the wrath to come, the just judgment that will fall. Christ has provided a righteousness that will stand before God. And he loves this. We worship our God because of his word. We worship God because of his works. We worship God because of his nature. But notice this, the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Mark Twain said, I can't see God doing anything in the world. I don't even know if there is a God. He said, it's miserable. 
It's a lousy world that we live in. Why don't more people write books about how nasty this world is and the meaningless of it? He's anticipating the nihilist school of existentialism. That's what he's writing about. But the Bible disagrees. He says, the earth is full of the steadfast love of the I am. In fact, as you look at that word, steadfast love, this is a word every Christian should camp out on. In the Hebrew language, it's chesed. Sometimes it's translated loyal love. I went through the Hebrew lexicon, and you know, this, this is how this word is defined. Get ready. Goodness, kindness, mercy, loveliness, loving kindness, rescuing from enemies, preserving, quickening of spiritual life, redeeming from sin, and keeping covenant. We don't have one word that can handle all that. This is a word that's distinctively, biblically uh, defined as God reveals himself. It's the word that we find, remember when Moses was in the, the cleft of the rock and God allows him to see just a glimmer of his being as he passes by in Exodus 34? He says, I am a God of chesed, loving kindness. In fact, this word is so rich that we find it not only used again and again, but it's what we are told in that great text of Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. He has shown you, O oh man, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy, to love showing kindness. The word in Hebrew means to bend over, to incline yourself to meet the need of someone that can't help themselves. It's really the parable of the Good Samaritan. Do you remember the priest who passed by? Do you remember the Levite who passed by? Then the unclean half-breed, heretic, Samaritan, what does he do? He sees the man half dead, and he bends over, picks him up, gets his hands dirty, invests in him. The good Samaritan shows us that this is the nature of God. This is what Jesus says we ought to be doing with our neighbor. Is there someone that God is saying to you today, if the world is full of steadfast love of the Lord, it's all around us if we have eyes to see it. Is it in my life? Am I a person of mercy? Am I a mercy of, uh, giver to people? I have a friend who's uh, written a book called The God Impulse. His name is Jack Alexander, a wonderful layman I've met in recent days. And he tells a story of mercy that really captured, if you will, the power of inclining yourself because the earth is full of mercy, especially wherever Christians go. He said he had learned of a quarry in India where the people were essentially slaved. They couldn't pay their debts, and all they did day in, day out, the whole family, just breaking up rocks. They couldn't escape. And by his leadership, the quarry slavery system was broken, and the entire quarry was given to the people who had been slaves. Isn't that wonderful? This happened in India. And he went over to see the people after all these things had transpired. And through an interpreter, he looked at a lady who'd been in the quarry as a slave for years, still working in the quarry. And he said, how do you feel about your work? She picked up a stone and held it to her heart. And she said, I love my work. And he said, how did you feel about your work before these changes? She picked up another rocket, spit on it, threw it down. That's the power of mercy. The world is full of mercy. And you know Jesus taught us. He knew this psalm. He taught us the parable of the Good Samaritan that we might understand how the world can be full of mercy. Is there someone that needs to see that extraordinary loving kindness through you? That's a prayer request, a homework assignment. Lord, who needs to see mercy from me to show that the world isn't like what Mark Twain described, a cold, evil, malignant world? I can show the kindness of a God who's filled it with his love. So we see this idea <clears throat> of mercy, but that's only the fourth reason why we worship the Lord, his word, his work, his nature, his general revelation that shows kindness and mercy because there are fruitful seasons, the suns keep shining 
Uh, we have rain. Whether you're a just or unjust, an atheist, God provides a world filled with good things. But we are the agents of that mercy. Read again Psalm 136. Do you remember how it ends? Each verse begins with something that reminds Israel of its, the saving history of God. And it says, His steadfast love endures forever. Every verse concludes with that. That's the refrain. His stead, and that's what you bring forth. That's what I should bring forth. In fact, Lamentations 3, and 23. Remember when Jeremiah wrote Lamentations? It's right at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. He's lamenting over the city. And right in the heart of that lament come these extraordinary words. Great is thy faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning. It's because of your mercy we are not consumed. Great is your faithfulness. So we sing that song, Great is your faithfulness or Great is thy faithfulness. And it tells us that God's mercies never end. Today, maybe you feel like you are unworthy. You might say, I don't know how I could be a good Samaritan. I'm the person left half dead. I'm unworthy of anybody caring for my wounds. God's mercy has not run out. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. There's mercy in the cross of Jesus Christ. There is forgiveness. There's kindness. Grace and mercy flows from our God. That is his nature. When it says in Lamentations 3, it is because of his mercy that we are not consumed. I did a, re a study of the word of, of mercy, and again and again it says it will not cease, it will not finish, it will die, not die, it will never be accomplished. It's always available for you. That's why we worship the Lord. But he doesn't stop there. His word, his works, his nature, his revelation filled with mercy, especially through the Christian living in the world following Christ. But he goes on to mention the stars. Look at this where he says, uh, verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. So you'll remember when God took Abram out and said, Take a look at the stars. If you can count them, so shall your seed be. Back in that day when there was no light pollution, and, of course, no telescopes. You might have been able to count maybe four to 5,000 stars if you had good eyesight. But how many do we know there are today? Well, uh, we understand there are approximately 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And we now understand that there are billions of uh, galaxies. I wrote the number down here. What does it say? 125 billion galaxies. I think we're going to find out even more now that we have something greater than the Hubble telescope. And so they've tried to calculate how many stars there are. That's 10 to the 22nd power. If you try to figure out that, that is several billions of trillions. You know the f uh, famous political saying, a billion here, a billion there, and soon it's real money? Well, a billion stars here and a billion stars, that's nothing. A trillion here, a trillion, that's still nothing. But it's amazing. All of those, according to Isaiah 40, God makes sure they exist. He calls everyone by name. Our God is far greater today than when Isaiah spoke of him. And we understand the magnificence of his power. We worship him. But it's not just the stars. He goes on to say, he also gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses in verse 7. He said, look at the stars and look at the ocean. And you know the, the sea is restless and dangerous for men. And women, as they try to travel, it's stories of how hard it is. The sea was always a dangerous place. But he's saying the Lord is sovereign over the seas. It's all under God. He put them in a storehouse, in a treasury where they are. And so someone has asked the question, how many drops of water are there in the seas? Anybody taking time to count them? Okay. Well, some scientist has figured this out. Here's what, he, here's what I found. If you're going to try to figure out how many drops of water, you have to say a drop isn't real big, and it can vary in size, that there are 2.664 times 10 to the 25th power of drops of water in the ocean. In other words, there are more drops of water in the ocean than there are stars in the universe. How about that? But then you take a little teaspoon. Here's another homework assignment. Do this with your grandkids. Get a teaspoon and then take 10 drops of water in a teaspoon, just about fills it up, and say, okay, how many atoms are in this? Do you know there are more atoms in that than there are stars in the universe? 
in one little teaspoon of water. The microscopic infinitude of our universe, the macroscopic infinitude of our universe, and it's all spoken into being when God said, let there be. Don't we have a reason to worship God? We can't take in the majesty of His greatness. He's far greater, whether it's the stars or the water or this extraordinary chesed. His loyal love is at work. Water continues to have its properties. The stars continue to be what they are because God is controlling them all. All of this is His faithfulness. Do you notice how it says that in faithfulness He has done these things in His work? Well, the second call to worship we find here then in verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. The worship leader is saying, yes, we as covenant people need to worship God with loud shouts, with musical instruments, because we have so many things to thank God for, his word, his work, his nature, his wonderful general revelation of his loving kindness and mercy, his sovereignty over the stars and the seas. But the whole world needs to worship him because he is the creator of them and their world as well. And so this is a divine call in verse 8, that the whole world will worship him. And when it says they need to fear the Lord, and they should stand in awe, the word for awe here says they should shake or be filled with dread. Why? Because they are living in rebellion to the God of the universe. Every word they speak is only possible by his work. Every drop of water they drink, every sunset they see, they all are gifts from God, their very life, and they're standing in rebellion to him. They should be in dread that they're in rebellion to the God of the universe. One of the uh, founding professors at Westminster named Dr. Van Til once uh, was riding up to New York City on the train. And while he was on the train, he saw a father with a young child in his lap, and the little child was riding with her dad and then turned around and slapped him in the face. And he said, whoa, that's an interesting scene. Hopefully it was a playful slap, but she gave him a real punch. And you can forgive a toddler for doing that, I guess. But then he thought, that father is the reason that child exists. Everything that little child has is because of him. Protection, food, shelter, life itself. And she turned around and slapped him in the face. That's the way the world is right now. They slap God in the face. They trample him underfoot. They reject him because they don't know him. That's where Hesed comes in again. Would you not in mercy say, I want these people who do not know Jesus to know who the God of the universe is? For he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through him. Do we hear that call to worship? How do we help that call to worship to take place? By building means of gospel witness to a needy world. Well, why should we in the world worship Yahweh then? This is verses 9 through 19. Let's read them just one at a time. It says, For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Again, God is the creator of everything. And the same creation that calls us to worship calls them to worship. And it's his command and it stands firm. That standing firm reminds us that there is a fixity to the universe. Why is it that you can predict certain things to happen if this happens? Because God is sustaining the universe. This is his providential governance. Physicists tell us there are four great forces. Do you remember what they are? Gravity. Gravity works everywhere in the universe. A Christian discovered that, Isaac Newton. He had a great equation for it. We've learned about electromagnetism. Light and, and electricity and magnetism are one and the same. And they work the same way everywhere. We've learned about weak forces that are involved in things like x-rays. <clears throat> We've learned about things like nuclear explosions, which are the strong force. And they work the same way every time whoever does them. And there are all these billions upon billions of countless atoms. They all do the same thing, the same way if you do the work. Why? They stood firm because God said, let it be. 
He's sustaining everything to be what it is. Science is not possible without God. A Christian can probe that point. Why does your mathematical numbers on a piece of paper describe a spaceship 100,000 miles away? Why? What makes it work? That you're in God's world thinking God's thoughts after him. It stood firm. But it doesn't stop there. It goes further. Another reason the whole world should worship the Lord is verse 10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. We're living in a war-torn era right now. And we've heard about uh, one possible explanation that the head of the Russian nation thought he could just walk in and take Ukraine by f causing them to fear, and it didn't happen. They fought back. His plans have been frustrated. Adolf Hitler said, you know, those Russians are so weak, they couldn't even defeat those Finnish people, so I'm going to clobber them too. And in his hubris, he had the winter war and nearly destroyed himself, but it caused the end of the war and defeat. The arrogance of people, of leadership, of power, they are under the counsel of God. Their counsel will not stand if God has not allowed them to be. God is the one who frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord, verse 11, stands forever. Everyone should worship God not only because He's sovereign over the nations, but He has a plan that cannot be thwarted. He can thwart their counsel, but His will not. The plans of His heart to all generations cannot be thwarted. That means his plans for this generation are absolutely secure. We are safe in God's sovereign counsel. We worship in all the nations. How about this verse 12? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Of course, this verse would have the most direct application to the nation of Israel. But notice it doesn't say, blessed is Israel, the nation whom God has chosen. It says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, inviting all the nations of the world to say, in God we trust, in God we worship, in God we seek. It's hard to understand, but there was once a time in these great United States where there was a concern that we would know the Bible Think of the most secular founding father you can think of. Well, Thomas Jefferson, you say, well, he was clearly a deist. Well, you know, as the president, while he was the head of the school board in Washington, D.C., you know what he made sure? There were Bibles for all the school students. How about that? He knew you needed to have the Bible to have an American republic. Because he agreed, even though he disagreed with many things with Washington's policy, when Washington's farewell address said, Religion and morality are indispensable supports for political prosperity. Once we remove religion, there will be no morals. And if there's no morals, a republic can't stand. Because as Washington said, they're just words on a piece of paper. A constitution can be set aside by a power-hungry leader aided and abetted by lazy voters. Quite a statement by Washington. So what are we saying? We have the opportunity to worship God and say... We would long to be a nation blessed because God is the Lord. In fact, this very verse was quoted by Abraham Lincoln when he established his prayer of fasting in the Civil War. He says, as it has been recorded in the ancient oracles, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And he called on the whole nation for a day of humil humiliation, fasting, and prayer. When's the last time you went to a day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. The whole nation was called to that. And this verse was used by President Lincoln. Further, how about this? We're looking at this great call to worship. Why do we worship God? All the world should worship Him because of His great Word that created, His great wisdom that rules, His sovereign will that overcomes all things, and because He's watching. Our God is not slumbering. Notice what it says it's in verse 13, the Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. Our God is watching. That's an amazing thing, and that ought to be a sanctifying influence for even the unbeliever. 
you will be held accountable. God sees it. There is a day of justice. But believer, God sees you too. He sees those things you do that no one else notices. And you might say, you know, I do all this and no one has ever said thank you. Our Lord is not so unjust that he will not remember the works you've done in righteousness, the writer of Hebrews says. And those things we shouldn't be doing. The Lord knows those too. He knows the secrets of our hearts, the things we should turn from. And so we should say to all, the Lord is going to hold us all, believer and unbeliever alike, accountable for what we've done. We need to worship him. If you don't have a savior, you should be in awe of him, tremble. Well, as we hasten to conclude, even our military is not enough to save us. The king is not saved by his great army in verse 16. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Build up the biggest army you want, and it's not enough to rescue you if God's sovereignty says no. We need to worship the God of the universe who's greater than the greatest army. Verse 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. All the world is called to look upon the Lord. And what is famine? It's not only natural, it's most often man-made by war. The Lord says the whole world needs to look to God because he's the one that can bring the end of wars to the end of the earth. We must conclude, what have we said thus far? We must worship the one who watches the world. He calls us to worship And we have so many reasons as believers to worship God for His Word, His work, His nature, His general revelation filled with His loving kindness, for His sovereignty over the stars and over the seas. The whole nation of the world, all people are called to come and dread and shake before Him in awe and fear to find His way because of His Word that created them, His wisdom that rules over them, His will that chooses a people out of them, His watching over them, holding them accountable, that their war is not strong enough to overcome His will, but most importantly, because of His warm welcome to those that come and find His provision. Verse 16, 18 and following, And behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him. He's looking to those that bow before Him. Those that hope in this steadfast love, this chesed that's everywhere. He will deliver them from the time of death, rescuing them from judgment. He will keep them alive in the vicissitudes of this world. And so the conclusion is the prayer that we all ought to make today. This should be our concluding prayer. Notice in verse 20, our soul. It's singular. Today I hope all of us would be a corporate body and say, together we agree. There is no division among us that we must wait upon Almighty God. He is the one whose purposes will stand. We will do our part. We will trust Him in our responsibility. But God is sovereign, and we wait upon Him. And He will help us. He is our shield. Our heart is glad in Him because we trust in His holy name. So let me conclude with these last two simple observations on the text. Why do you wait for something? You know, at Westminster, the rule is you wait for a professor for 15 minutes, and if he doesn't show up, you can leave. Why do you wait for your professor? Well, you figure you got to get your lecture. You paid for the class, after all. Well, hopefully you're there because you want what he wants to give you. You hope that you'll get some learning that will go with you the rest of your life. You hope that it will be a blessing. Well, William J., the English congregational minister, said, we wait on God because, first of all, we have a deep conviction that God is good. And when God shows up, it's worth waiting for. We have a desire for Him. We hunger and thirst for righteousness, and there's no other place to to find this except in God. We have hope. That is, that God has better things for us than this moment. We believe that time and all things are in God's hand according to His will, and therefore we have patience. God is not slack concerning His promises. We wait upon Him. The other thing I want to emphasize is the word trust. We we notice this in conclusion in verse 21. We are waiting for God. We are glad in Him. We're worshiping through all of these situations of life. And we trust in His holy name. The Hebrew word here is worth learning. Batakti. The word for trust in Hebrew is batakti. What does it mean? 
It means to depend completely on something. And you know what's amazing about this word? There's no cognate word for it in any of the other ancient Near Eastern languages. You didn't trust Moloch. You didn't trust Baal. You didn't trust Ashtaroth. You didn't trust the gods of the world. They were fickle, capricious, untrustworthy. You might conjole them. You might try to bargain with them. But you would never trust them. But the Hebrew religion has a God whose name is the I am that I am. He does not change. I, the Lord God, change not. You can trust in him. Today, as we look at this psalm, whatever you brought in your heart and your life to this moment, worship your God, for he is trustworthy. His purposes are sure. And so we can say in verse 22, as we trust in this one who does not change, whose word is promised to be absolutely honest and trustworthy, verse 22, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. So today, this is my prayer, that you'd understand more than any place else, the trustworthiness of God has been vouchsafed in the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. If you're bearing burdens, come to me. My burden is light. Trust in me. You trust in the Father, trust in me. My peace I give unto you, not the kind of peace the world gives. My peace I give to you. With that promise, let's love Mark Twain, but not believe what he believed. The world is filled with the loyal love of God, and we worship, and it's yours today. Lord, please teach us by your word and spirit that we worship you, the one who watches the world, the one who fills us with hope, and we thank you for it all in Christ's name. Amen. Allow me to give you this blessing of God's word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.